it does, but it's the best way to learn about cultural history at the moment. Is there anything on that? Uh, when did you pick up the when did you pick up the word preservation? Have we started? Yeah. Okay. All right. Justin, you want to turn up that lamp on a little bit? Does that give you a little glow? We're, we're good on light. We're good on light. Okay. <laughs> okay. We're ready to start. Uh, we are here on August the 19th, 2014, uh, in the uh, former residence of the dean of the former Newcomb College. How dare you say that? Of Newcomb College, uh, sitting in the double parlor uh, with um, Ruach Paladano, a graduate of Newcomb College, uh, who uh, has been doing preservation uh, her entire life, but particularly in from after she graduated in, from Newcomb in the 1960s to the present day, still fighting uh, for architectural heritage. I'm here in uh, the house with Justin Nystrom, a, a professor of history at Loyola University, and we are doing this for the Loyola Oral History Project about the 1970s. Uh, I'm Jack Davis. And I will be asking the first questions, and uh, Justin may join in, join in with questions later on. Um, Rulock, the the, um, the real uh, energy in, in preservation in, in the 1970s in New Orleans uh, came from a very small group of people, of which you were one and probably uh, a leader or the leader, uh, but it also came from series of books that you uh, collaborated on, on the history of New Orleans architecture, uh, starting in 1971. How did you, well, let's go back to, how did you become a preservationist? When did you first realize that you were, that's what you were? We tease in my family with the Bunkleys of West Texas, all of whom had come to Tulane, my father, my grandfather, all of my uncles. And they say, I must have started with preservation when I was three months old because my father was in Richardson Hall in the uh, medical school and my nanny from Alabama began strolling me around the campus because we lived on Broadway. And uh, that went on for a year or two and perhaps my earliest memories are these wonderful buildings of Tulane University in the original green. And then Subsequently, I came back to Newcomb when I was 17. But in between times, we came to New Orleans and checked into Roosevelt every year and came out to Audubon Park to see Tulane and Newcomb and, of course, the Roosevelt Hotel, built, strangely, by Albert Toledano. And I later married a Toledano and realized that Albert Toledano had built the Zamuri House, which is where the president of Tulane lives, as well as the Pavillon and the Lafayette Hotels, were lines for music. And so when I married into a family that had had an architect who was very active in the last quarter of the 19th century, I became even more interested in architecture. And having come from West Texas, where there's not a building anywhere because we had ranches in Texas and in New Mexico, buildings were what meant culture to me. And should we uh, take, take a quick break? And I asked them to hush up. Just you might want to tell them what we're doing so that yeah, we'll they. Uh, hope we don't have to start over with no. all of that. <laughs> can you pick? Can you pick out those sounds from uh, even with that background? I mean, it's there, but the background will be there as well. Well, if you want to start over, that's fine too. I think we're okay. I'll let you decide technically. Can you? Uh, we're going to have a transcript, but we can still hear the. Oh, we will have transcripts. So, so we will still have the. Uh, I'm actually still recording all this. So okay. Right. I have to go over that well. So, you graduated from Newcomb, 1960. Were you a preservationist then? Well, I had spent my junior year at the University of Madrid, and I became what I call a regionalist when I was there. 
here we are in Spain, but we're not in Spain. We're in Castilla, Aragon, Catalonia, the Basque countries, and indeed Andalusia, which is where my soon-to-be husband's ancestors came from. They moved to New Orleans in 1768. It's Comandante for the new activating Spanish government. So I learned that I like the Gulf South. I'm not interested in Virginia or the Eastern Seaboard South. The Gulf South is what is interesting to me, and there was not so much written about the Gulf South architecture or culture at that time in the early 60s as, of course, Virginia and the early states. Even Tennessee had books about it, and of course, South Carolina. But when you get down to Georgia, and ultimately I wrote the National Trust Guide to Savannah, which is the premier city of Georgia, but we need things even today about uh, Mississippi, Alabama, and Louisiana. Well, when you got back in 1959, 59, what was the state of uh, awareness about the need to preserve New Orleans, New Orleans character? When there was well, a we had had a disaster. They tore down the St. Charles Hotel. That was disgusting. I don't know who did it, but as you know, after World War II, everything in America began to be torn down because for some reason there was money right and left after the war, and all of the GIs came back and they had the, the money to from the government to build a ranch-style house somewhere. So ranch-style houses were taking over New Orleans and they didn't fit in at all out in Metairie and Gentilly and everywhere else. So when the, when the the St. Charles Hotel went down, that was, you know, really frightening. So much history had taken place there and books having been written about it. So but that was later. Is well, that, that was a bit, it, but it's sort of in the middle 70s. of things. But uh, 1966 was when preservation uh, theoretically began in New Orleans. The uh, National Preservation Act had taken place and the city of New Orleans was farsighted enough to arranged for there to be a great survey of uh, Orleans, uh, St. Bernard, and uh, Jefferson Parishes. And Bessie Swanson worked with Dr. Bernard Lemon of Tulane, and Bill an Collison, architectural historian. an ar architectural historian, and Bill Collison, and Tommy Ryan, who was an archeologist, but from New Orleans, who had gone to LSU, and paid practically nothing they surveyed the three parishes, uh, it took years, and Betsy herself, a, a Newcomb graduate, her mother had also been a Newcomb graduate, typed this ill-funded thing up. And she, after years working with Dr. Lemon, thought we should have books about this with the photographs. And she, of course, had taken the photographs, but in the official study, either they were miniature or they just made maps and put the photographs in a file somewhere. She appeared at my house, I guess it was the late, I don't know when it was, uh, the late 60s, neither of us can remember. She knew me from Newcomb, but she was a year ahead of me and had, was getting a master's when I was a senior. But she knew I had been very active with the Friends of the Cabildo, with Mary Lou Christovich and others. She, and she appears at my house unsolicited on Chestnut Street, where I lived with my then, uh, two or three children, <laughs> and uh, said, would you help write a book? I have met with Dr. Milburn Calhoun in the Pelican Publishing Company. And I said, what are you talking about? And she began to describe this survey that had been done, and I was, of course, extremely excited, and I blurted out, well, we could work with the Friends of the Cabildo, but you can't do anything in, pre in any kind of culture in New Orleans without Mary Lou Christovich, who is practically invented cultural philanthropy. So let's go over to her house tomorrow with this idea. And we went then to the Curtis and Davis house out uh, toward the lakefront where Mary Lou and Bill Christovich lived with their family. And in no time at all, we had begun research on what became volume one of New Orleans architecture. And we did the worst neighborhoods first. Don't you, worry. You tactically picked an Lillard. area that had no name, it had no name. It, and we, we knew it was part of the Irish Channel and we knew it was in a big mess because the uh, expressway was coming over and they had just torn down the last great plantation house, I think it was the Soleil House, to 
put an entrance to the bridge. It was frightening. And it was between the Central Business District and the Garden District itself. Now, the Garden District was in good shape. It always has been. But this area, the lower, that we named by accident, the Lower Garden District, the book had already, was it the press? And we said, what are we going to name this book? And it was Betsy who said, well, the Garden District is so well named, let's call it the Lower because it is, you know, lower mm -hmm. along the river, lower. And that will, uh, if we say Garden District but lower, maybe people will read it, otherwise they won't. But meanwhile, we had gotten volunteers to run titles. We had discovered the Civil District Court. We had discovered, of course, Dr. Lemon and Sam Wilson had discovered them long before we had. Both but Sam they Wilson, took another us. architect. Yes. Ar architect and preservationist and architect he, historian. Our mentors were Sam Wilson and Bernard Lemon. And the first thing we did was ask them to write volume one of New Orleans Architecture. And indeed they did, but we were editors and co-writers and did essays in the books and this and that and the other. But meanwhile, they introduced us. Betsy had already taken a lot of pictures of the archival drawings. Now archival drawings are unique to New Orleans so far as I know. I'm going to Carcassonne in the fall because Bartholomew Lafon was an architect who had gone to the university there, came here, and taught a young refugee from St. Domingue, Joseph Pellier. And Joseph Pellier, in the early 1800s, became the city surveyor and invented archival drawings. And we don't know how he knew to do this. And so you discovered the archival drawings in the notarial archives? In the notarial archives. And these became a major uh, feature of the, all the books, but particularly the They became the a Garden major Garden. feature because when a, when a building went up for a sheriff's sale or in an estate, Joseph Pellier, either himself or someone he assigned for $10, went out and measured the the property that was being sold, measured the lot, and made a drawing that had certain things that PBA said you must do. The background has to be pink, there has to be yellow streets, and this and that and the other. And then by 1824, you must put an elevation in each drawing. So these... So you had a site plan and a building and layout and an elevation. Right. And not only... And why did you publish those? Because suddenly we think, there is a falling down house. And we think, there's an archival drawing of it. Whoever owns it can restore it exactly, measurement by measurement, even you know down to the least windows. So we would show these archival drawings to people, and then we would put them in the book. And we realized that New Orleans had six, say, six kinds of architecture. And all of these carpenters just copied one another. And that's the best way to do anything. So when you showed people the drawings and they saw the book, did that directly prompt preservation it of those definitely, particular buildings? And it definitely prompted it. But more important, the people who were volunteers bought houses that they had researched. Camille Strawn bought, I think, a 1717 Coliseum. And she got all of her friends to buy houses on Coliseum Street and Howard Smalls and Lydia. And all of these people who had worked with us as volunteers began buying these falling down but exquisite houses around town. In the, and particularly in the Lower Garden District. Particularly in and, the Lower and Garden. And so what, did that happen before the book came out? Or no, was no, it right. a result of publication? A result of publication, but you see these Junior League volunteers and other volunteers from the Friends of the Cabildo would get excited about what they were researching right. in many cases, most especially Camille and Duncan Strawn and Sally Hype Smith and Wallace Smith. Were, were, he was a doctor here and she graduated from Tulane. Lots of people bought historic houses because they were pointed out in the first volume of New Orleans architecture in the early 70s, but they began to be interested during the research of the subsequent volumes. And volume two was the Central Business District. Now that's a hard one because, but our central D business district has people living there and among the first events. And that was, came out in 1972. We were later, working very fast. We were working fast. We, we were called working that the fast. American sector. 
the American sector, but it's Faubourg Saint Mary. Uh, Monsieur Gravier, who owned it as a plantation, his wife was Mary, and he named uh, the Faubourg when he developed it. Uh, it was the first American Faubourg. Um, that it was the first plantation subdivided, and it became the American Central Business District because the French Quarter was the Creole mm -hmm. Central Business District as well as the residential area. So upriver from Canal became the American sector, and that's why we call that book the American sector, Faubourg St. Mary. And at that time, New Orleans um, was, was um, booming in lots of ways, including economically, and right. the the building boom, real estate investment, was involved a lot of demolitions in the American sector, the central business. It was a, you were competing with that. We were fighting it daily. And one of the things that happened is uh, we went beside uh, driving down all of the streets doing research for the book. For example, Bill Kellison would pick me up, and I would stick one of my children in the back seat, and off we would go. And we decided we would do a book on James Gallier, which we never did because we were too busy doing architecture books. But during the research, I passed a building at uh, 700 Carondelet. And lo, there was an archival drawing showing that James Robb, one of the richest people in New Orleans, had owned these buildings in the 1850s, I think maybe as bathhouses. I'm not sure. I don't remember right now. But my husband, Ben C. Toledano's law firm, bought it, bought the buildings and renovated them, and Sam Wilson helped them renovate. And uh, that is the Porteous, Toledano, Hankel, and Johnson at one time. Where there were the law firms. So you were, you were writing about them, but also instigating working. actual... During the time of researching and writing the books, Ben C. and I restored or renovated about eight houses uptown, mostly uptown two on Nashville Avenue, this silly good looking still, and uh, one on Jefferson Avenue, some on Camp Street, Chestnut Street. But then, when we had finished the Lower Garden District book and Camille was well along on her way with many other preservationists working on Coliseum Square and that area. In the Lower Garden District. In the Lower Garden District. It, what ha was happening on Carondelet and Barone was disgusting. In the central business district? Well, no. This was in the lower garden district okay. tw between Arato and Clio and the Muse streets. No one would do anything there, and I know that it had been fantastic. There are wonderful buildings there. What happened? What happened? I don't know. But we combined our energies with the money of Bob F. Wright, who was a good friend of ours from Lafayette and a lawyer in Ben C's law class. And we bought, with the help of a Frenchman, Pierre, I believe, Rossillon, uh, two or three square blocks over there. And we, we said, look, there's this entire square with houses. I ran the titles of all the houses that we bought. I said, a Beauregard, General Beauregard owned these two houses. Why? And I looked up and found out that he bought the houses for the rental income so he could send John Bell Hood's children to college. Beauregard did that. He brought, he knew Jubal Early was dying, or I mean was very, very poor and in bad shape. And he brought him down here to work with uh, people. And he did a lot of good works. But for me, to save those two buildings to send Texas John Bell Hood's uh, kids to college, John Bell Hood had died of yellow fever after losing an arm and a leg in the, in the Civil War. So this was very interesting to me. So I said, we will make a hotel out of all the old buildings on this block. And there were the, the Beauregard buildings. And then on Carondelet were two lovely brick buildings. They would fit very well in the Garden District, but they were earlier. They were in the Lower Garden District, built as rental units for Walter Parlange, a Parlange plantation. So here were two houses on one street, two houses on the other, and then dotted in between were some wonderful shotguns and uh, townhouses. So we got together with Peter Traplin. The architect. The architect, Peter, and he was a young man at the time, and the truth is, not many architects were too interested in this project. They thought we were crazy. And, and <laughs> this was early 1970s. Yes, in the 1970s. And we, uh, Design, we said, heavens, we will put infill in between each of these old houses. 
and that infill will have to, this, this hotel will have to have at least nine foot ceilings. I mean, the houses, some of them had 12 or 14 foot ceilings, but they have to look appropriate. And then we said, there's so much crime in this neighborhood, we better make fake windows on the front. And we will have this out of precast concrete. And one day, all of the precast concrete buildings, uh, facades, came from Mississippi. And I had all of the workers who were, uh, most of them worked by the hour. And then when we got into the hotel, it was Audubon uh, Construction Company, I think, and we got everybody together because we figured we had to put this hotel up in one night. So we put the facades up and they had fake windows in the front with fake batten shutters closed. Well, sure, even though we had a guard, just one, that was not enough. The next morning, crowbars were everywhere. The uh, people <laughs> had tried to break in to the windows of the new hotel. Of the fake, through the fake yeah, windows. Yeah, they didn't know they were now fake. Th this is the hotel that's been called Maison St. Charles. Maison St. Charles Hotel, and it's still going strong. And it's a 131 room hotel, and the suites are in the old houses. And over time, I remember the slave quarters of the Parlange Plantation were a lovely restaurant at one time. And because of being all along a square, there are beautiful gardens inside the, you know, inside the uh, center of this hotel. So you did this strategically to uh, attempt to, s to stabilize this neighborhood? Yeah, to did save the neighborhood. Well, <laughs> we then hired for the help at the hotel some of the neighbors. And I got an urban development action grant thanks to uh, Moon Landrew, who I think was with HEW, Health, Education, and Welfare. Now he was with what? HUD. HUD, HUD. Later on, but yeah. not, but at that time he was the, well maybe it was, if it was in the late 1970s, yeah, late. then he was at HUD. He, he was by this time, when because this project went on four or five years. <laughs> and he, uh, and Lindy Boggs got us a, a I think it was a $3 million urban development action grant. Well, that was wonderful, except suddenly I had to double the price of my workers because they were in, you know, we didn't have contractors and we were renovating about 12 houses all around that we had had to buy to protect the hotel. And these 12 houses were beautiful, if you could ever get through the mess, were beautiful antebellum frame and brick houses, townhouses, double houses, but the sagas that went on as we were trying to restore them, we went to one house that we had just bought on Carondelet, and I said, let's look at the slave quarter. And we walked back there, and there was an old black man on a cot. And I said, sir, sir, what's happening here? I've been here since World War II. I said, what? Who feeds you? The lady next door. No bathroom, no nothing. And Bob Wright would, was so, you know, he was so upset about this that he did all kinds of things to get the man into a veteran's home right away. But he had been there since World War II. I mean, he was ancient and paralyzed. And we found the ladies that had been, you know, the neighboring people who would bring him food every day, but how could, how could he have lived? So did you stabilize the neighborhood? We, we, we think we stabilized the neighborhood. <laughs> we stabilized the neighborhood and put people in these houses, uh, that, the ones that were empty. And then in 83, uh, we left town to go see a mountain in Virginia. And Bob Wright was left with all of these. The hotel was doing well, but he lives in Lafayette and he presented the buildings themselves and the property to uh, the foundation that we had developed, and now it's called the Felicity Foundation. And it has, a, a, at the time it did not, but now it has an executive director, and they were doing so well until Katrina came along. And that was a very bad, you know, in Katrina, that neighborhood flooded rather badly and some houses went down. Can I take you back to the, the central business district, the mm -hmm. American sector? Mm -hmm. I mean, this is, the hotel is in sort of one edge of the... Right, it's district. right there at but, the edge of the then, CBD. But this, the CBD, uh, what about the battle between the, the people who wanted to develop uh, and thought they had to demolish their old houses as quickly as possible before the preservationists blocked them and, right. uh, and the preservationists who were trying to educate well, the public we, about Well, it was a matter of education and it was also a matter of 
popularity. It became popular to save buildings. And lots of people and uh, save buildings. Now, lots of architects wanted to tear buildings down and, and uh, build new buildings. And certainly, we envisioned Poydras Street as, OK, we'll sacrifice Poydras Street. Sacrifice the old buildings. The old buildings on Poydras Street. And if that could just be a whole line of skyscrapers. But you will remember these, we called it Italianate buildings. What street was that on St. Charles? A whole block of Italianate buildings. And we devised the idea of having the Italian piazza there. Mm -hmm. All of that was truly a project to save that row of Italianate buildings. And it, it was sort of tacky to connect the Italianate buildings up with the, uh, uh, the Sicilians who lived here, but we did. And uh, it worked out for a while, but then they tore them down. Then the buildings went. Tore but the now, block down. But so getting back to the impact of that book, it mm -hmm. came out in 1972. Uh, well, the Andres bought buildings next door to Toledano, uh, 40s Toledano, Hankel and Johnson, and then lots of lawyers did mm -hmm. buy old buildings. There, there were tons of 1830s townhouses. and. Uh, John Geyser and other people worked really hard to save buildings in the downtown area. And you know, it became sort of stylish and Lafayette Square just had people lying on the ground. And now, as you know, they have music there every week and lots of festivities and we repopularized Gallier Hall. The old city hall. The old city hall. The, um the, the, the city council passed a moratorium on demolitions in, I think it was 1974, oh. a couple years after the book came out. They also, at the same time, uh, passed a moratorium on demolitions on parts of St. Charles Avenue. Right. Uh, just to hold the, the status quo of the, of, the, of the buildings while they figured out what to do and right. eventually create a historic district. But did, did the book lead to that? The book led to that and many more things because we devised these books to be uh, lovely uh, coffee table books. But within the coffee table uh, format, we put the history of each of 600 buildings. And you open the book and you have to find there are skyscrapers in the book that are Art Deco and other kinds of things with photographs of them. So we did not leave out, we consider lovely, you know, uh, important commercial buildings we included, but New Orleans Central Business District is one of the few that has tons and tons of townhouses, three bay, beautiful townhouses, much with many of them built by James Gallier and Henry Howard and famous architects in the city. And beside, not far from, tall, uh, you know, big buildings, but we said, don't worry, that's fine, just, that's fine. If you have a 20-story a building next to a two-story building, all right, and restaurants are in some of those two-story buildings, uh, coffee houses, it, you know, it worked out very, very well, except time has passed now, you know, and the pressure is constant. The, by the end of the 1970s, this, this uh, sense of the worth of the, of the Central Business District's historic buildings fed into the planning for the 1984 World's Fair. It did. Which, it. which was located in, in parts of this. And area. the Warehouse District, which is part of the Central yeah. Business District. And actually, even today, for example, the uh, Gelderman, Tony Gelderman has just finished renovating and opening at a restaurant in mm -hmm. one of the famous old coffee buildings, I mm -hmm. think, and there are still uh, buildings that are were where the, uh, the World's Fair was, and that World's Fair brought attention to an area that was just dead. I know that I went with uh, a member of uh, my husband's family who had closed the French Market Coffee Company at the time, or, or parts of it, mm -hmm. and they thought of selling a great large warehouse for $90,000 you know, in the early 70s, and now that's worth millions and millions. Well, c can you make a connection between the advocacy you were doing in this book about the American sector and the World's Fair, uh, which was being constructed 10 years later? 
was was the World's Fair? Um, did the World's Fair planners see this as an attractive neighborhood as a result of the research? Well, I do know that I was called to be on a committee of, of the World's Fair because of this book, and I do know that the World's Fair revitalized the neighborhood, and at that time. It was the only place for New Orleanians to convene. It was not just a world's fair for foreigners and, no. and um, tourists to come to, but local people met each other at the world's fair, and they would eat and have fun with their children, and it would be a family event. And this, this was very, very important. I think it was one of the most familial world's fairs that have ever taken place. Do you think they took advantage, they took good advantage of the setting? I think you that they did. The I actually do think that they did. The, the, um, so the Friends of the Cavildo, publishing the history of the New Orleans architecture books. Mm -hmm. uh, the third book came out in 1974, the Creole Faubourgs, and then uh, the... Uh, the Cemeteries. From I'm sorry, the Cemeteries from 1974. Yeah, the, the Cemeteries. Volume three, and the fourth was the Creole Faubourgs, yeah. also in 74, according to my quick read. But at, at that, you also had this flock fleet herd of volunteers who were doing uh, work on this, and they were... They were amazing. And, and did that, as, as I, I think you told me once, they became uh, the, the, um, the core of, uh, of a lot of organizations, Junior League included, that led to the Preservation Resource Center. Absolutely. Now, for example, volunteers would become co-authors with Mary Lou uh -huh. and Betsy and myself with the books. For example, Sally Evans, now Reeves, uh, was a volunteer, I believe, with the, with the Junior League. And we said, good heavens, her research is so superior. Her essays are magnificent. Let's make her a co-author. And similarly, Pat Holden, Mrs. Jack Holden, was a co-author of the American Sector. And Bessie Swanson brought her into the circle of co-authors and others have helped uh, you know through the centuries photographers and uh, we felt an urgency after we had done the uh, American sector Mary Lou felt that the cemeteries it was Mary Lou Christovich who was the person in charge completely of the cemetery book and uh, she started Save Our Cemeteries which now has an executive director and is getting grants to save the uh, cemetery, the outside walls, and uh, pave the streets, streets, I call them streets, that go through the cemeteries, like Lafayette. And uh, while she was finishing that up, we started research on the Faubourg uh, Marigny, the Creole suburbs, we called it. And at that time, there was no interest much at all in Faubourg Marigny. Uh, and did you do this tactically, again, to, to stimulate we, interest in Marigny? Absolutely. We wanted to save Faubourg Marigny. And I remember uh, Betsy Swanson and I walking way down, I believe, on Charter Street. And, uh, you know, 38, way down beyond what they now call Bywater. And we saw this old uh, tin barn-like thing, and I said, I see a column, a Spanish colonial style column with the end passage going out, coming out of that old building. And we sort of walked around and, and that was the Lombard house. That was the first clue. And uh, Bessie uh, went in, uh, probably illegally, and we took pictures. And in time, you know the result of that, Fred Starr has made one of the great, restored and reconstructed the slave quarters to become one of the most perfect restorations in New Orleans and internationally known. And, and he, it's and the Lombard down, House of, of 1828. And he managed to tear down the bar that was in his front yard. Yeah, the bar in his front yard separate. went adios. And, and has written a separate book about it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so you, so the um, Marigny was, do you think, do you have any uh, um, indication that Marigny started taking off as a desirable place? Oh, because As a result of, of the book? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Gene Sizzik didn't live there bef before this book. You know, yeah. he... Another Tulane architectural historian. Absolutely, had, had a preservation. 
Um, he, he helped so much. I took many tour, tourists. I was the study tour guide for the Art Institute of Chicago and the New York Art Museum and the National Trust for Historic Preservation. And Marini was the favorite location to go. Marini, absolutely. And remember, is it Ann Cooper and Mark, Mark Cooper? At one time, they were one of the first couple to live in the Marini and restore an old building and then yet another. And uh, now people say, oh, do you want to live in the Triangle? I said, where's the Triangle? Oh, that's over there where New Marini is. Everybody has the whole vocabulary. Uh, you want to live on Turo Street? Oh, you <laughs> they tell you where you want to live. So in, in the, the middle of the 1970s when, when this was going on, did, did you ha think that the uh, Preservation Resource Center founded in 1974 would last as long as it has, celebrating its well, 40th birthday? When, when, it, when we all, the volunteers, started the Preservation Resource Center and Patty Gay was selected as the very first executive director, and she still is the ex executive director there, we knew that the, it was necessary to have an organization like that, but we never dreamed of its effectiveness. It's unbelievable how effective the Preservation Resource Center is in their, just in their magazine, with Campanelli from Tulane Campanella. University. Richard Campanelli. Richard, writing uh, uh, stories every, you know, pieces every month that are original research, primary research. I mean, our books are all primary research, but we hardly have any secondary research. We were at the archives day and night, and matching up buildings like the Lombard House has has a, an archival drawing by Joseph Pueyo, P-U-E-Y-O. And it's a beautiful drawing, and I, I think that it was essential to the exact restoration of that house. And there are many other houses I've just put together for a gentleman who wants to build a, he owns great amounts of property on a river somewhere across the lake, and he wants to build a Marini, a new Marini <laughs> over there. And I went up and down the street collecting from our books uh, the photographs and making new photographs of corner buildings and the kinds of buildings that I myself would s collect together to do a, a six block <laughs> new ma Nouvelle Marini across the lake. Uh, and uh, architects call me all the time asking me for, could you get one of those drawings that are in your books about you know, this and that, and I tell them where to go in the notarial archives and to take a picture so that they can see the exact measurement. You can build a house, don't, you don't need the architect anymore. You can build a house from a, a close view of those architectural renderings that were done by over, I believe over 50 people did them over time, that they had to use the template that Joseph Pellier had set up. And that's what you accomplish in large part by publishing the New Orleans oh, pattern book. Right. Oh, I then, uh, living in Virginia, I was carried away to sort of uh, put together a book that was just in one volume. You know, we have now so many volumes of New Orleans architecture, one for each of the neighborhoods, although we're still missing Carrollton and Gretna and uh, Algiers and Nine Miles Point. But I put together one book selecting just from the, the fun of it, and my uh, son-in-law, who is an architect, Gate Pratt, did drawings showing people how to renovate or to build any kind of New Orleans house style, from the, the Creole style or, and the American style. All the, n we didn't go to much past. We just went to the Victorian style. This is a 21st century book, though. This is a 21st century yes, book, yes. but you can still look like you're 1820 easily <laughs> in New Orleans. Well, well, now back to the, the Friends of the Cabildo series. So, so the um, volume five was the Esplanade Ridge in 1977, yes, and, and volume six was uh, Treme and Bayou Road uh, in 1980. Those were the ones that uh, Mary Lou and Bessie Swanson and myself and Sally Evans worked on, uh, and I have to say that Faubourg Treme is my very favorite of all because Treme has just been transformed once more because of the book. For example, I was 
got a call and, uh, from the Art Institute of Chicago, and I arranged for the people there to visit uh, the Bynum's house. Mm -hmm. And they called and said they had to go to a funeral. Adolph with and Nadia Bynum. Adolph and Nadia Bynum. She's once the president of the Preservation Resource Center. And they renovate numerous houses in Especially both the Maroney and the Treme. And they said, go to 1231 Marae and Scott Vesey will greet you. Well, I never heard of Scott Vesey, and I was too busy to check out which house was 1231 Marae. And we, the bus let us out, and I said, oh, this is my favorite house of my book on New Orleans Architecture, Volume 7. Why, it's been restored. It was falling down. Well, the door opens, and this young man has my book on architecture in his hand. And he says, uh, it was volume seven, volume, volume the, the six Faubourg was, Treme, Faubourg six Treme. Six was tr Faubourg Treme. Yeah, he had that book in his hand. And he said, I have never met Rulak Toledano, but my entire career has been selecting books, uh, houses that she and her cohorts and other, other authors have recommended through the books on architecture. And my favorite was where I live, it's 1231, 33, I believe, Mare, where the, uh, Carence Cousin lived. And here was this 18, I think 28 house, totally restored, and these double slave quarters at the back, double two-story slave quarters. Then you go right around the corner, and there's the Simone Mayur house, now the New Orleans African American Museum. It was a home that belonged to the director of the then Delgado Museum, Alonzo Lansford. And after his death, I don't know how, but it became a museum. And that is one of the most exquisite houses, 1821, I believe. And, but all through the Treme, and uh, people have gone a little over, overly wild about it, saying it was the first black neighborhood in America, and it was not. It was the first mixed neighborhood seriously mixed neighborhood in America. For example, Simone Meilleur was a white man and he had what we call a place and a number of children who were persons of color. And he acknowledged these persons. And if you acknowledged your, if a white man acknowledged their colored children before a notary, they were his forced heirs, they inherited. And I did an exhibit at that museum on the Bambara, because 80% of the Africans who were brought to New Orleans during the French were Bambara, now they call them Bamana, from Mali, and they left from Senegal. And it so happens that Dakar and Saint Louis and the towns in Senegal were, had become French. Previously, they had been Portuguese. And when they became French, they were renovated and rebuilt at the same time that New Orleans was built. So now people are giving lectures of the Historic New Orleans Collection. We'll have a lecture this Wednesday on comparing, you know, Senegal and Louisiana, which is a whole new take on things, and it's because of this slave trade. Uh, and uh, these people could speak their own language, and therefore they developed uh, a society, and they influenced the white Creole, Spanish and French, in a way that we have not made a complete study about yet, but it's quite interesting. And the African art uh, exhibit that you had at the uh, African American Museum was, was about two or three years ago. Right, and I have a website. It's, it, I think you look up N-O-A-A-M dash on the, in the middle, bambara.org, or I think you can look up Bambara, or you can look up my name. So, and so now back to the 1970s and the book series. Uh, by the end of the 19. 70s, uh, you, you published six volumes. You, you, you said you, you, you regret leaving places out. I mean, you mentioned uh, Carrollton, Gretna, Algiers. Uh, well, we Atlanta, hadn't gotten to them yet. Yeah. Yeah, they, and and that's the only reason they were left out. But I, uh, Ben C. and I and my family moved to Virginia to see a mountain in 1983. And uh, Mary Lou went on to other interests, Mary Lou Christovich, and the project was taken over by uh, the Cangelosi uh -huh. and uh, a number of the other volunteers. It's Robbie Cangelosi. Robbie Cangelosi. And uh, 
some of the other uh, volunteers continued to be authors and co-authors of the subsequent books, and they got uptown. They just haven't gotten to Carrollton yeah. yet. Well, they got uh, to what they call Jefferson City, uh, mm -hmm. in the heart of uptown in 1989. So there was a nine-year lapse after you left. Well. And then uh, volume eight, I think, was the university section. Right. In, uh, in 1997. Right. Uh, but uh, So they are there more? Is they did the not. They did not use archival drawings, nor did they use Betsy. Betsy Swanson went on to other things too at that time, and it was a, a new group, but volunteers and all from the Friends of the Cabildo, mm -hmm. the Junior League, that kind of thing. So the books did continue on, and as I understand it, Ann Masson and Robbie Cangelosi, I, I think I have it right, had finished a book on the French Quarter because you know we did the worst neighborhoods first, but now we're to the good neighborhood. And they were continuing on, and they uh, because of Katrina, the computers were drowned and everything was lost. So that has set things back enormously, but I, I, I presume that they're continuing on. Are there, are there neighborhoods that you wished you had gotten to? Oh, I love Algiers and Gretna, and that, that neighborhood, and it's across the river, uh, and uh, it probably is not appreciated quite so much. And then I, so much of New Orleans history has to do with uh, St. Bernard Parish. That's where so, the early great plantations were of the Ducro, the De Reggio, the Beauregard. And uh, Bill Highland has done a good job with the Canary Islanders who came over. He has a museum relative to that subject. But now there's so many people interested in the Battle of New Orleans and uh, the, the Beauregard house out there, but the LeBeau house burned down the other day, one of the great plantations that needed fixing up. It's just horrifying that these things are going, going. The um, impact uh, of the books, I, mean, I keep coming back to that. Who, that was a, um, a force in favor of preservation. Who were you fighting? Who were the preservationists we battling had, in the 1970s? We did not envision price. ourselves as having any enemies because all of us were women who had families and uh, responsibilities, but we were out working on those books also, all day, every day. And uh, I was bu building the hotel at the same time that we were working on a book. And before nine o'clock, I first had the children were delivered to Newman or to McGee's. And before nine o'clock, I had had to speak Cajun French French, French, Spanish, and English, <laughs> because as I said, on the hotel, we didn't, I, we never on any of our restorations had contractors. We had fantastic Creole carpenters who had, whose parent, whose fathers were carpenters and carpenters and carpenters back to the, and so they knew history just as much as those of us who'd written the, the books on architecture. They di didn't know the vocabulary perhaps, but with the hammers and the nails, they knew what to do. So I was out working with them, and in those days, in the 70s, I hope I have this correctly, it was not illegal to employ illegal aliens. You didn't ask them whether they were illegal aliens, but still, you were not responsible, as no, that no. I believe it's against the law now. So we had a number of wonderful Guatemalans, El Salvadorians, and a Nicaraguan roofer that were just excellent. And uh, but they, I said to all of them in whatever language I had to say it, your boss is Archie Swain, and then your other boss is Floyd Raymanick, and they are black uh, carpenters, longtime New Orleanians, and they only speak English. So do not work for me unless you're prepared for these black people to be your boss. Well, this was, you understand, we were in the 70s. And they, of course, were enjoying working on these projects because they were independent and they were paid every Friday afternoon and, you know, it worked out very well. So you didn't feel like you were battling uh, against the no. forces who were uh, anti-preservationists? Absolutely not, it didn't occur to us. We just were going along under our own steam and we were making preservation popular through these volunteers. And uh, I never noticed any antagonism anywhere. Yeah. I think you succeeded in getting some of the real estate developers who were putting up the big new buildings. 
to, well, to, 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 co to have a preservation sense? Well, I was really lucky because I wrote a, 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 an article called House of the Week. <laughs> I was going to mention that because of all the things you said that you were doing then, you were also writing a weekly column in Figaro called the House of the Week, which put a focus on preservation. And I would go so specific properties. And I would, of course, mention this house is for sale by Ladder and Bloom, and mention the name of the person, and they would call me. Oh, because of of the article in Figaro, because of Figaro, I sold my house the next day. And that would make the realtors like the idea of preservation even more. And then I wrote an article about uh, Fort Macomb, and Betsy Swanson told me it was effective in saving Fort Macomb and getting the people uh, at the state um, place out on the Rigolese mm -hmm. uh, to put some money in it and save it and keep it from falling in the water. And we had hoped to get interest in Fort St. Philip and the ones out in Plaquemine Parish uh, around English Turn and further out. You have to go in boats to see those, uh, you know, forts that are still there that are essential history to the United States. So there's lots more to be done, but I have to say in the, er, the realtors were fascinated with all of this and they were, and what, some realtors what, what, helped us. With what about the developers? I, 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 didn't you have conversations with Joseph Canazero about <laughs> About well, how he could incorporate uh, build old well, buildings. Well, we would talk to him when wasn't he d doing uh, the where the Fifth Avenue, uh, the Saks Fifth Avenue is, and all of that at the Canal end of Place. Canal Street, and we would joke with him because wasn't he from Mississippi? Yes. And we would joke and say, how could a Mississippi boy not want to save all of these buildings in New Orleans because that must have been the big city that you came to, and we would just have fun conversations, but we. We, as, so far as we knew, we never made enemies with anyone. There's enough houses to go around. Uh, City Hall, did you help? Did you get help from the Landrieu administration for uh, the mechanics of, of preserving the city? I mean, they they got they eventually got interested in passing historic district legislation mm -hmm. that protected places and creating the. District Landmarks Commission. Right. Uh, w w were they helpful all this whole time? Well, the, the funny story, uh, when we got the Urban Development Action Grant to work on the uh, hotel over there in the Lower Garden District on Carondelet, uh, the money, sometimes uh, the payroll at the end of the week was $40,000. And the money came first to the state of Louisiana in Baton Rouge and then through the mayor's office, and uh, D Dutch Moyal was the mayor, and the money would never get there. <laughs> and so uh, I sent word to the office that we would send a runner to Baton Rouge, you know, a car to Baton Rouge on Thursday, or Wednesday, whatever, and take it right to City Hall. Well, the money was still unforthcoming, and I would have to go to the Whitney Bank and borrow $40,000 every Friday. <laughs> <laughs> Sir, would you mind <laughs> that kind of thing? And they knew what we were doing, and they were very uh, cooperative. And uh, one time, I finally went to the office of Dutch Morial, and uh, I was waiting for an hour, and then an hour and a half. And I, I said to this gentleman who was his aide at the time, I said, "Please tell Dutch Morial that my family were Huguenots, and they never owned slaves, and he has no reason." <laughs> <laughs> to be angry at me for trying to save buildings in New Orleans. And would he please give me the money to pay my workers who are all minorities? <laughs> was, was City Hall holding that money up or was it well, just Well, we'll never know. <laughs> was uh, Dutch Morial a preservationist? Uh, I would say, I don't know how the New Orleans African American Museum became that because it was Alonzo Lansford's house and during Mark Morial's uh, mayorship, it became that museum. So I don't know, but someone must have been interested in old buildings. Uh, was, uh, was Moon Landrieu a preservationist? Well, he was helpful in getting me the money to mm -hmm. have that urban development action grant. And I would say uh, definitely, uh, and now members of his family live out toward Bayou St. John. And you know, we had the problem of I don't remember the date, but moving the Petot House one block 
to save it for the Louisiana landmarks. And then we had the, I remember going into the Benaki Torrey house where uh, Esplanade Avenue meets Bayou Road. Yeah. And the Mrs. Torrey were there and they ended up because of our efforts to tell them we love this house and it must be saved forever. And I believe they uh, left it in some fashion to Louisiana, or made it possible for Louisiana Landmarks to acquire it and then they you know, found a good home for the house. So was the Landrieu administration uh, interested in what you were trying to do in the Central Business District in, the, in 1972? Well, um, since my husband ran against Moon <laughs> for mayor, but we, during all of this, we were still very good friends, and we still are. And uh, at the time, you know, Moon had other things on his mind, and I think preservation was not important enough. But it didn't keep preservation from happening. Certainly nothing kept preservation from happening at all. Do you remember dealing with uh, members of the Landry staff who were uh, helpful or not? I mean, no, Tony, Tony I don't. Gagliano or Rena Godshaw? No, I, I did not, but by that time, no. you understand that Mary Lou Christovich was the business manager of these projects, and uh, she not only was a co-author and we researched together, but it was from her house that the books emanated, that she had one entire area of her house turned decked out at the office, and the volunteers would go there to work, and she would be the person that did the business aspect of things, which would include the political aspect. And I was left out of the loop from that point of view, as I said, because my husband was busy being a, trying to develop a Republican party or something, and I would not be suitable for <laughs> that kind of thing, therefore. Did uh, Pelican Press was an interesting story. Uh, did, did they make any money on these books? Well, you know, and Betsy was the first person before we even started the books to go to Milburn Calhoun, and he had not had that press for very long. You know, Pelican, Press started out somewhere like Harmonson's bookstore downtown. It started downtown, and Sherwood Anderson and other famous Creoles may have been the first book that it published. And then it went on and on through many owners, including uh, Hotting Carter's sons, but it never became a serious press until Milburn Calhoun, who is a medical doctor, and his wife bought it. And they lived over there, and they put the name Gretna on it and went to town. And now it's probably the biggest press in the south of the United States, and they could publish a book and just publish 10,000 of them and come out. And the head of, of Knopf told me when I sent a book to them, they said, we'll write a letter saying this book is worthy of publication, but Rulock, we have to publish 40,000 books, and you won't sell 40,000 of the, these books, and that was a a biography it had nothing to do with preservation but that's when I realized how grateful we are and should be to Milburn Calhoun for publishing those books on architecture and we had do you, do you know how many copies of I each have, they printed? Did I they have ever? no idea but I do know Mary Lou Christovich put in the uh, contract that he had to keep them in print so long as 200 a year were sold but we gave our... Um, and are they still in print? They are st still in print. And, and we, in paperback? In also. paperback. We, uh, we gave our potential uh, money that we would have made from the books to the Friends of the Cabildo. And we never bothered to ask how many were sold. But they are still, they have been very loyal. They keep those books in print. And you know, their storehouse burned down about 10 years, I don't know, 10 or 15 years ago. And some boys were playing on New Year's Eve or something and threw a candle or a, um, you know, whatever, in the church where all their books were stored and they could have taken that as an opportunity never to reprint them, but they had them out in paperback within a few months. And when I want to order a book, you know, a box of them to give to people for Christmas or whatever, or to have a, a people, you know, we still have almost signings. For example, when my pattern book came out, at my signings, I had these other books also. And they don't talk about uh, getting rid of them by any means. And he died not long ago, and his daughter has taken over. And I got a, an email from her not long ago. Did we have any projects? They would love to publish 
volume nine. Ta da! <laughs> well, uh, when, when you were uh, preserving, uh, encouraging people to engage in preservation in Treme and Marin and, uh, and on the edge of the, the, in the area where the hotel was between Central City mm -hmm. and Central Business District, did you ever hear the word we hear in 2014, which is gentrification? As a as a bad thing, was anybody? We never heard that word. <laughs> it, we did not really ever hear that word. And of course, when we did, we had an urban development action grant uh, for three million dollars. We could not displace one person, black or white. So when we renovated about forty units, we would move the person to the next unit and finish that unit. So if they wanted to, they could go back in. And most of the most of the people were black. In fact, you know, 90 something percent of the people in that area at the time were black, and we never displaced any of them. Did you ever hear uh, any criticism that this was some kind of uh, elite, elitist or, or never, uh, race, never. race based uh, uh, changing of the city? No, because we, I had my staff over there, and they became friends with all of the people who lived around there, and I became friends with all of the people. I'm friendly. <laughs> And I loved all those people over there, and they're still my friends. And they, they, nobody thought of saying, oh, these people are building a hotel for whites only. None of that. Well, when uh, I think in the introduction to the um, volume one of the Lower Garden District, uh, Ray Samuel, who was then the president of the Friends of the Cabildo, said uh, he wanted to start something. Uh -oh. That was the idea. And it looks like you, you had quite an, an amazing impact. Well, we, I feel that we saved the city. I don't want to sound tacky about that, but at every neighborhood, Maroney was nothing. Bessie said they knew it was Foberg Maroney, but that Bywater was a telephone uh, exchange, and it was just something to use because you can't keep having Foberg Clue, Foberg Darby, Foberg this and that and the other. And an interesting thing happened with Foberg Maroney. I was researching away, and I had uh, my daughter, Rulock Darby Toledano, and Sam Wilson presents me with an article. He said, I didn't know that your husband, Ben, was related to Jonathan Darby, who came to New Orleans in 1719 and made the first picture, you know, illustration of the city. He, and he knew it had been established in 1718, and he had a drawing of, uh, of uh, Benville out in the swamp sticking up a pike and saying, you know, this will be Nouvelle Orleans. But Darby wrote a little history of the city that he tried to get published in Saint-Domingue, and he never got it published. And finally, at long after his death, it was published by the Philadelphia Catholic Historic Society. And then finally, it was put in the Louisiana Historical Quarterly, not under his name, but under the name of a doctor who found in Paris somewhere the, the manuscript and translated it himself. And so while Darby is mentioned in his text, you can't, you can't find the name Darby in the index of the Louisiana Historical Quarterly. But Darby, it turns out, Sam said, not only am I giving you this little book, but did you know he owned everything from Esplanade to the Industrial Canal at one time? And I said, the family has no idea of that. Well, he, off and on, he did, and, and he, for example, when his daughter marries Jean de la Villeburg, he gives to the uh, archbishop who did the wedding, he arranged, the archbishop can buy four orphans so facing the river, going back. And these are the, this is the area that became the Mandeville de Marigny Plantation, and Faubourg Clue, and all kinds of smaller plantations that you can read about in the Marigny book but we call that by water because it gets very complex. Well, when all this was happening in preservation and architecture in New Orleans in the early 1970s, did, did you ever see the, uh, these other currents of sort of cultural development that were taking place in New Orleans, namely in food? Um, we love to sort of take advantage of that. Richard Collins uh, started writing about, writing his column, The Underground Gourmet, or the restaurant review in 1970 or I think we had uh, the first jazz festival in uh, at, uh, at under George Ween was in 1970 uh, we had Moon Landrieu taking office 
in 1970 and ending some of the, uh, uh, the previous administration's uh, segregation policies and started loosening up, mm -hmm. the, getting it, making it possible to integrate New Orleans business. Did you see uh, business and culture? Did you see those currents happening as you were um, trying to save New Orleans architectural heritage? I do remember when, uh, very young, uh, Quint Davis working on that jazz mm -hmm. complex and uh, wasn't one of the first ones in the Louis Armstrong Park. Yeah, in Congo Square. In Cong and the yeah. old quote, Congo yeah. Square. Well, we had written, of course, about Congo Square and its importance, and we had written lots of things that were a, a bit unusual to slavery here in that most uh, property owners would allow or plantation owners would allow their slaves off on Sunday to come to the French market and sell the vegetables that they themselves had grown for their own use. The money would go to the slaves quite often rather than to the master, which is unusual. And we had found all of this out and then it seemed to us when we were writing the book that Louis Armstrong was ignored. He was so famous, you understand, in the world. And yet we would be talking about other jazz specialists who had French names and were Creoles of color. And I think that there was a certain segregation idea and they didn't just didn't like Louis Armstrong because he was such an African American. And he was born on Perdido Street. And of course we know the famous story that he was, he shot a gun one time up into the air and was sent to the waif's home, but that is where he saw a musical instrument for the first, he would never have seen a musical instrument where he came from, you know, he was very poor. And he really learned about what to do in the waif's home, but when he first was sent to England and people in England paid for him to come there and they met him at the boat from, New, you know, he'd left from New Orleans, not New York, I think he left from New Orleans to go, and he was window shopping with them and they stopped in front of a musical place and they, he said, what is that? And they said, what is what? He said, that beautiful instrument there. He had never seen a saxophone. This was, I really can't believe that story, but uh, I heard it so and that, I, it's been printed. So how did you help uh, Quint Davis uh, with the Well, festival? we just thought that the, that the whole idea of Congo Square would be just wonderful to, you know, do that thing, but it quickly outgrew any ideas that we had of a small festival and became a, this wonderful thing. I had, a, I had a book signing out there one time and it was unbelievable. And Dave Matthews, who learned to play music in my, ha in my warehouse in Charlottesville, was there at his first appearance in New Orleans. And and what about the food? Did food help preservation? Or well, preservation we, food? we we were eating all over town as we were researching. And I remember in Treme was Helene's restaurant. Shea Helene. Shea Helene. And it said, no t-shirts or cur uh, curlers allowed. And I was with Betsy and she was forever in a t-shirt. So I would bring a blouse along so that we could go eat there. And we would always, there, we would be the only white people there then because you know this was when we were first doing the books, but we were so excited at all of these restaurants that developed in the historic buildings in our book in the Fo in, in uh, Foberg Marigny and the Bywater, Elizabeth, all kinds of restaurants. And subsequent to the book's publication. Right, right, right yeah. after the book pu was published, it seemed as though they were just bouncing around down there. So there was a hunger for food and there was a, a, a desire on Part of new well, both of it, it had new restaurant people wanted locations. Right, and they would use these old buildings. I know at the corner of uh, Carondelet and Girard is a, was a restaurant that was in one of the oldest buildings in town, and I was taking uh, Sir Nicholas Pevsner, the great English, now English, uh, architect around, and he really did not like New Orleans architecture very much because it was not grandiose enough. And he announced to me that he only liked the customs house. And of course, Beauregard had been the builder, uh, you know, uh, because it was an official building. And so I explained the re family relationship, great, great, blah, blah, uncle of my children, of General Beauregard. 
And then we went, I wanted to introduce him to my husband, and we went to the office and he said, oh, those Regency buildings in the 500 block of Carondelet and these little modesty, teeny buildings still there, uh, thank God, on the riverside of the 500 block of Carondelet. And at the corner was a restaurant, so we ate there. <laughs> so we love that. Yeah, and then do you remember which food one is culture. I don't know what the, it's not there anymore. It, it's a restaurant, but a new name. But food is culture and architecture is culture and they are one, you know, it, it's all the same. So, should I should ask uh, Professor Nystrom if he has any uh, additional questions at this point? I just have a couple. Well, let's uh, let's let you ask. Them. Yeah. Well, did you? You want to take a quick break? Uh, no. So, could you talk a little more about Sam Wilson? Oh heavens, that go! He is our hero and our our mentor. And do you know he told me that he had never been to the French Quarter in high school. You know, he, he was an uptown Catholic boy, and he went to Tulane Architecture School, but I, I literally would go to his house at, at least two or three nights a week to work on the books and to say, we don't know this, and we don't know that, and we don't know the other. And I went to his office often to edit uh, a book that uh, we put together about uh, the early French drawings that were brought to the Louisiana State Museum and we made a little catalog and I, I literally typed it. He would talk and I would type up what he said. And, you know, his wife was a Latrobe, but his hero was Benjamin Latrobe and his wife was a, a direct descendant of Benjamin Latrobe or Henry. And um, they lived on Washington Avenue, I think, and we would just talk all night about the books. We never went into his particular background, and I know that things have been written about Sam, but he was uh, such a the perfect gentleman at all times and would help us at any time that we wanted. And of course, he was the author with Bernard Lemon of the first book, and uh, but from then on, they were, were and, you know, they were, we were all authors, so to speak, I guess. I don't know how it went. But he never refused to take time off and assist. And uh, at one time, I called him because we were renovating over there at the hotel, and I said, what size should columns be? And I said, do I just buy a bunch of one by eights and stick them together and make a box column? And he said, no, one side is 10 inches for lock, and one side is 12 inches, and you know, on and on. And so he, he helped, and then with uh, the law firm on, on Carondelet. But we were just busy working all the time, and we, we lived for our time, with, or I did, for our time with both Sam and Bernard, and I would often have lunch with Bernard Lemon because he lived more uptown, and he was still an active professor and we would be sitting at a restaurant and there was always the same people beside us, these four men. And I said, Dr. Lemon, why are, why, are, why are we always eating with these same four men at a table one or two away? Oh, don't think a thing of it. I'm head of people against Vietnam, the Vietnam War. And that's the FBI, the CIA, but don't worry, they won't bother. <laughs> oh, gee. You know, he was an activist along those lines. But uh, having done that, he was much more a practical person, and having done that 1966 survey, we were dependent upon all of his work. But uh, Sam, uh, you, you know, he, at that time, when he would do a renovation or a restor what I'd call it a restoration, I think it was $100 a square foot. And now, you know, the cheapest house in town is $400 a square foot, and then you have to renovate it. Was, was Sam Wilson the, um, he was certainly the busiest preservation and restoration architect practicing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, was he, he was it. Was he the first? I think he must have been the very first. I, I cannot even think of another name. Uh, Richard Koch, his mentor was yeah. Richard Koch, of and, course. And, and, yeah. and they did, Richard Koch did the Historic and American Building Survey drawings, and Sam did many the of them too. In the 1930s, they did the Historic American Building Survey drawings, and those are online now. 
and you can write any kind of book about and just pull it up. For example, I became excited that during the Spanish colonial years in 1794, I believe it was, Carondelet announced that all roofs must be flat. And he called them. I went to the public library and looked it up. He said, uh, Sam had translated it terraced roofs. And I said, now that doesn't make sense. Terraced roofs, what does he mean? Slanted roofs or roofs like that? And uh, the people that in the View Correct Courier copied Sam and used terraced roofs. Well, I went to the library, the public library, which has all of the records, uh, and he said, they used the word azoteas, and that is a, a Spanish Arab word, Hispano Arabic word, that means roof garden. And uh, Carondelet said that the buildings, this was after the 1794, I think, fire, he said, Buildings must be rebuilt only in brick with az ladrillos. He used the word ladrillos, which is brick in Spanish, con azoteas, and that is the Hispano-Arabic word, and it started in Syria among the Muslims because their women were not allowed uh, to be on the street, of course, and so they began to have their laundry and their flowers and everything put out on the roof, and they could look over the roof and go down. And if you go through the French Quarter, there are no azoteas left, but they're there underneath and the... They've been covered up. Yeah, because the, the, uh, they leaked no matter what. And they leaked because, uh, it's so disgusting, um, Carondelet had said, you have to go get tiles from Pensacola that we import that will be waterproof. But he didn't think to say, don't use soft river sand brick from, uh, soft river sand sand, you know, for mortar, and so they all leaked. And in Puerto Rico, they don't leak because they use volcanic ash for their mortar. But we use the soft river sand, so all of them are replaced by a French style, you know, big hip roofs. And uh, so I got all excited about the azoteas, and in the Historic American Building Survey, many drawings show the azotea underneath. And so I went to Moss Antiques, it's I think that's 411 Royal, and they still have the original stairway of the 1780s or 90s. That's one of the really old, great, you know, New Orleans houses. Going to the roof now, the roof, the flat roof is gone, but and but the it dead ends up there where it should be. And there is one Azotea building on Dumain. There used to be four buildings on Dumain. I don't remember right around the corner from the Presbyter. Uh, yeah of the dildo, whichever one it is. And there's a para, it's a Creole cottage with a parapet, with little holes made out of tiles. And that was an azotea, all four of them had azoteas, and that azotea is still there. So I think that, that is exciting, and you can learn about every azotea by looking at Richard Copes and Sam Wilson's drawings. I didn't know that. Um, renovations are full of surprises. sakes. I don't think I ever had any advice. I just went right on and did it. <laughs> but my advice, it, it would be terrible to say uh, out loud, is that I learned so much about renovation from my own paid by the hour New Orleans carpenters. Floyd Ramonick and Archie Swain were three or fourth generation carpenters. There were many, many others and the, and the Hispanic middle American ones who had learned from their fathers. And uh, I then wrote an article thinking about this, restoration by analogy. You just look at the building next door, the one you're restoring. One of them in the block is exactly like yours because we only had about six or eight styles and just find the best one or go to the archives and find an archival drawing. It might not be of your would-be house, but it's the one exactly like your would-be house. Like here we have, this is a probably a Spanish colonial Creole cottage. Spanish colonial Creole cottages had a, a stick out band of uh, cement or, or uh, 
stucco banding the house like this, up above like that. And you just can go around the French Quarter and see, see buildings that are Spanish colonial still there. And you just copy some other house and, and, or look at an archival drawing. So I did not, uh, you know, hear too much from anybody because we started the, the big craze for renovation. <laughs> and other than Sam and Bernard and Mr. Cope was already passed on. I don't know who it would have been beside the carpenters themselves. What, what would you identify as the biggest loss preservation-wise in the 1970s? The biggest loss? Well, the biggest loss was before, long before that, the, the St. Charles Hotel. And I try to shut my eyes, but there are plenty of them. I, I, I just see empty lots and cry. I cannot think of any, uh, have they torn down any churches lately? They were always about to do that. I don't know. I can't, I just try to be positive and look toward what's still there or what we can still do. The train stations were all gone oh, in the dear. 1970s. Yeah, they were gone. But the, the synagogue behind K and D Plaza was torn down in oh. the 70s. Oh, dear. For parking. Okay. I think of what was torn down across America for parking. In fact, Paul Tulane gave an enormous number of buildings to establish Tulane University. And his particular, uh, his will or his instructions were, you keep these buildings and you will have a portfolio equal or better than that of Vanderbilt University. And the immediate will of every board since then was to sell the buildings. And so if you go down and you see an empty you know, parking lot corner, it has belonged to Tulane. Or if you see a new skyscraper, that lot probably belonged to Tulane. And the building that Degas, painted in 1874 of the stock, the stock brokers mm -hmm. or whatever, the sugar brokers. Cotton Exchange. Cotton Exchange. That building, half of it belonged to Tulane at one time. And uh, it needs, at last count, it was about to fall down, but I don't know. I see a bunch of work on that building. I hope so. And you know, Persians came to town uh, in the 70s. Things, uh, Iranians, and you would say, oh, you Iranian, no, I'm, no, I'm Persian. And they were all very nice. Uh, it was under the Shaw, and I, you would meet them socially, I guess. And uh, they bought bunches of buildings. And then all that problem came in Khomeini and the rest of it. And there are numbers of buildings in this town that are very historic that are falling down because the Iranians have deserted them, you know, their buildings know or, can't, or got killed or whatever. Yeah, it's very sad. So the title is in Limbo? Right? right, I guess so. I don't know how they. I just knew of certain buildings that had belonged to them, and uh, after the hurricane, you know, they mm -hmm. nobody ever came to fix them up. And that would have been in the late 1970s because right. the Iranian Revolution was 79 or 80. Right, right, and things got bad. So that's sad. That's something no one thinks about. Anything else, Christy? Is there anything uh, that you wanted to tell us about? <laughs> Preservation in the 1970s. It's not that, that I've told all. That. It's not that I, I have told all, but I will say that I, I never thought about having adversaries. Uh, even though buildings went down before our eyes and we would curse these people who tore them down, you just, education is everything. Education, and you think, if only my alma mater would teach more preservation history, if only the Tulane School of Architecture, you know, they no longer have Sam Wilson or, or Bernard Lemon, if they would only teach the fact that the culture of a country is reflected best in its architecture. And New Orleans, I mean, we don't want to compare it to Houston. We really don't. <laughs> and we just need to save everything we have. I mean, what, Ursuline, look at that nice Ursuline. And look at that wonderful Sacred Heart and the wonderful uh, McGee School. And what if they decided to have a modern building? It would be disgusting. Well, well somebody will remind them. Of we that. hope so. And the churches are holding on pretty well, thank God. But the houses, the houses, you, you know, people have to live in houses. And I love in New Orleans the mix of residential and commercial. 
everywhere. That's so important to me. And the, of course, most place, most cities don't have that at all. Do you worry that in uh, areas that are on the fringes of what's been rebuilt since Katrina, there are a lot of houses that are um, at risk because the population is gone. Yeah. Um, you I'm bought, gone. You bought <laughs> I'm a gone. House. You're gone, but you bought a house in the seventh ward. Yes. Seventh ward. Is that One day it? I was. Is uh, that, it's a half of a. A Creole cottage. It is a or Creole. It's a, it's a two, two bay, bay Creole. Creole it's a two bay Creole cottage. I could not resist. After the hurricane, I'm looking in that New Marigny and and Treme, driving around with Scott Vesey, with whom I'm writing a book about an early 20th century lady artist who painted buildings, and we, he has done over about 85 buildings, and some of them he sells and some of them he collects rent, and we're driving down the street, and I said, oh, I. I just love that house. And my son-in-law, Gate Pratt, had told me about the house, but I hadn't considered going to Romall Street. And I said, that's the house, that's the address that uh, Gate said I would like the house. And I bought it because it was just $12,000. <laughs> it was brick between post. It was a 1780 house, but built in 1840 because they didn't subdivide that plantation, the Pettis Clove. Duchamp Plantation until 1839, so it could not have been before that, but it looks like it's about 1780, and they didn't even, they didn't even use a circular saw that had been invented for the wood. They used the old time, straight up and down kind of saw. And everything you could about tell that from your own archeology span on the... Right, right, and Peter Patu came in and pointed out a lot of things. That he said, this is, not an 1830 house. I said, well, it didn't move Peter here. Peter Patu, the antiques dealer. The antiques dealer, yeah. He knows a lot about architecture. So can you tell us where that is on It's 1518 North Roman, and it's and one reason I bought it is my kids' ancestors' streets are all around. Kellerac, their great, great, blah, 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 uncle was uh, Governor Kellerac from Wren, France, who was the last Spanish, last, which kind of, last French colonial governor. He was from Rennes, France, and um, uh, Lappy Roos is a name I have known from Mobile, Alabama for a long time, and uh, all the streets around, Romal Street, where they, uh, Governor Romal was an ancestor of my kids, and so it was so fun. It was like we were just in the middle of history with the names of the streets, much less the fantastic free old cottages and early, early shotguns there. And when we got into the house... And uh, so you bought it, and we, you started renovating it. it. Well, I said, who's going to renovate it? I don't live here anymore. And uh, Scott is a, a person who, like me, has a number of carpenters. And we have this wonderful crew. The bricklayer, I think, was from Peru. And uh, one boy, Mike, Mike the uh, carpenter, had gone to Delgado. And uh, he is wonderful. And we had... Salvadorians, again, we, a lot of uh, Latin Americans who came after Katrina. They flew down here, and uh, he, used, he uses these people on a number of his renovations, but I was able to take advantage. And uh, again, he paid them every Friday, and I'd send a check down. And we had a party with the Preservation Resource Center, and by that time, I had eaten at all the places all around, and there's a place around the corner that says Cajun cooking or something, right under the horrible expressway, the Claiborne Expressway, and you go in and, and they, I think, are from South Korea, or you know, they are Asian, but they have all this wonderful Creole food, and I said, give me a gallon of this, 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 and this, and we had a big party when we finished the house. I think I was there. I hope so. So it, you have it rented out? It's rented out to uh, uh, some idealistic people. You know how uh, these charter schools started and this couple came down from well France and New York to teach at the charter schools out of, you know wanting to do goody kind of people and the the girl's last name is Casimir which is a well-known Creole name here a Creole of color and she is Haitian but from New York City and a graduate of Bennington College and uh, her husband uh, Mr. Monsieur Siar S-I-A-R uh, he's from Guadeloupe, and they met at the University of Angers in France, and I had just been to the University of Angers to do research on parterre gardens, and I said, 
Where did you meet on the campus? And they met on the parterre gardens. <laughs> and so they came down here and um, they take really good care of the house. That's great. And they teach at the charter schools and do good. Anything else, Justin? Well, I thank you just terrifically for, um, for describing all of that. Uh, well, it was fun to reminisce. Voluminous activity. When you, when you t uh, first suggested we were going to talk about the 70s, I said, when was that? What <laughs> happened there? And then finally I did realize the book started there, and I do feel strongly that the, the books, which were a volunteer effort all the way around, and the Friends of the Cabildo and Mary Lou Christovich have to take credit for saving the city. Thank you very much. Thank you.